So now we're going to talk about access control models. Now an access control model uh, specifies how uh, we do access control. So we, have, we are going to talk about several. Uh, so we're going to talk about identity-based access control and role-based access control. Uh, in identity-based access control, we have uh, the identity which is tied to the access rights and the operations. Whereas in, in role-based access control, you have a role which is tied to access rights and operations, and you can have several roles. Uh, finally, we have attribute-based access control, which is the most general access control model, uh, where you specify the policy in terms of very general attributes. Uh, finally, we have uh, the two extreme variants, discretionary and mandatory access control, uh, that we will uh, talk a bit about. But let's start with identity-based access control. So identity-based access control uh, means that the access rights are defined in terms of objects and the subject's identity. So for instance, Alice may read document D, Bob may write document D, uh, it's the, the subject's identity and the access operation and the, the object in question that, that we, we specify. So this means that uh, Alice may read the entire document D and Bob may do whatever he likes uh, over writing document D. Now, obviously this is uh, not that scalable if we get a lot of identities and a lot of objects. So uh, we, want, we need to, to do something about this to make it more manageable. Now, uh, what we want to do is to introduce some intermediate level of complexity. So for instance, we can add groups and then we simply map users to groups and then we map groups to objects. So we have this uh, layer in between here now, the, the groups. And the groups are, uh, will be uh, fewer than the uh, users in total. So it's easier to, to manage the groups rather than the users individually. Now, role-based access control generalizes this idea. So here you have uh, a role which basically maps quite nicely to, to a group, but role-based access control allows more uh, a different semantics. So a uh, role-based access control basically has these three rules that we see here. So we have a uh, role assignment, says that the subject can perform an access operation only if the subject has selected or been assigned a role. Now, so you need a role to be able to, to do anything in this system. So that's what the, the first rule is saying. The second rule says uh, role authorization. That says that a subject's uh, active role must be authorized for the subject, which means that you cannot choose rules, uh, chose, uh, choose ro roles as you like, you, you have to be authorized to, to choose the role. So this means that we have some type of access control on the roles as well. So for instance, uh, if we have two roles, teacher and student, of course, uh, the students shouldn't be able to, to switch to the teacher role and, and set uh, a grade on themselves. Uh, so uh, there should be some access control to these roles. Uh, the final rule uh, says uh, is about the, the access rights, so right authorization. And uh, this says that a subject can perform an access operation only if it's authorized for the user's active role. So uh, the role that the, the user has currently taken uh, that one must be authorized to do the access operation on the particular object in question. Now, 
Rule-based access control allows for more complex semantics than just read and write. So uh, for instance, we have that Alice may read the file. Sure, it, it may, may have these operations, but it, it allows for, for uh, specifying data types and not only files. So for instance, you can change uh, some parts of the file or you're allowed to read only parts of the file. Uh, so that's, uh, that's part of the, the model. So it's, it has a bit more complex semantics. Now there are various extensions to uh, role-based access control. I think the original uh, paper on role-based access control was, was published in the mid 90s and uh, there has been uh, some work done on that uh, since then. So what we've talked about so far is the, the so-called flat role-based access control. And uh, this is simply users are assigned to roles and permissions are assigned to roles. Uh, so then users uh, get permissions through their uh, different roles. Uh, there is also a hierarchical role-based access control which adds support for role hierarchy. So for instance, if we have one role teacher and another teacher's assistant, then obviously the teacher's assistant should be a subset of the teacher's, uh, teacher's permissions. So the teacher is probably allowed to do the same things as the teacher's assistant, uh, but he's also allowed to do more. And the third one is constrained role-based access control. And this adds what, uh, what is called separation of duties uh, to the RBAC model. And this means that someone is not allowed to, to switch between the roles arbitrarily, but there are some restrictions. So for instance, you're not uh, allowed to switch from student to teacher's assistant in the same course because then you might be able to grade yourself and that's not allowed. However, you're allowed to switch to, uh, to the teacher's assistant role uh, in uh, another course. So you can, you can define uh, these constraints on the roles so, so you're not allowed to switch as you like. Next, we have attribute-based access control, which generalizes role-based access control. So this uh, model uses attributes to specify the policy. So this also makes it simpler than the identity-based access control, since you don't have to and manage the identities. You, you simply care about attributes, uh, which is more general, and then you, you can specify uh, quite fine-grained in the policy what, what is allowed and what is not allowed. And the policy in attribute-based access control is basically Boolean formulas of attributes. Uh, and if uh, the, the criteria on the attributes are, are true, then the, the reference monitor will allow the, the operation, the requested operation, uh, so the subject may, may proceed. Now, attribute-based access control, it has a recommended architecture for the, for the reference monitor. We will look at that one uh, just uh, now. So the, the architecture has a policy enforcement point, which inspects uh, the requests and generates authorization requests for the policy decision point. And the policy decision point evaluates uh, against uh, the policies to, to see if it uh, should be allowed or not. And it returns permit or deny. And then the policy enforcement point uh, enforces this, uh, this decision. Uh, there is also a policy information point which uh, can be used by the policy decision point to access uh, attribute databases and all the information that the policy decision point might need to make a decision uh, for the request. So all, all of these three are uh, part of the, the reference monitor of the system. 
So it's part of the what enforces uh, the policy, but it's it's split in these uh, three parts. The attributes, as I said, could be basically anything. So for instance, it can be subject attributes, for instance, the age of the subject, the subject's clearance or department or role or whatever. Uh, and it can also be action attributes. So for instance, read, delete, write, so the, the uh, attributes of the, the operation that the subject wants to do. It can also be attributes of the object, so type, owner, classification, location. So all, all of these three allows us to, to basically use attribute-based access control to implement uh, the, the previous policies. So it's easy to see that we can implement the uh, identity-based access control because identity is a subject attribute. And uh, we can also uh, do this thanks to, to having action attributes because uh, then we can have the different operations that we, we allowed and also the, the object attributes. So identity of the object uh, is uh, also an attribute that we can use. And uh, we can also implement uh, role-based access control because uh, we can specify different roles for, for the subject. So those are subject attributes but we can also allow for contextual attributes. So for instance, the time uh, that the operation is happening at, the location, and so on. So we can have uh, a wider, uh, we can do, do more in these uh, policies. So um, as I said, the, the attributes of uh, the, the system is uh, basically basically a set of uh, Boolean formulas which are evaluated on the set of attributes. And if it's true, then we allow or deny. Uh, so you can set uh, policies that explicitly deny some combination of attributes or uh, allows other attribute combinations of other attributes. Now the policy uh, can be uh, anything. So for instance, we can have a user U can view a document D if D is in the same department as U. So we see that we have uh, several attributes here. So we have the identity U and we have the identity of a document D and we also have another attribute of D which is uh, the department and this is also an attribute of uh, the user U here. And uh, so we're using two attributes in this, uh, in this uh, rule for the policy. Uh, we can also say that you can edit D if D is in draft mode. So then we still have the identity U here and the identity D and the uh, draft mode is an attribute of the document as well. Finally, we can uh, have a rule saying that uh, deny access to D from any foreign connection. So then we, we have the where the subject is connecting from as one attribute. And if that is a foreign connection, so we can see on this connection if it's from, if it's domestic or foreign, and if it's foreign, we simply deny uh, the connection. Now, one question we haven't uh, talked about so far is who should set the access policy? And there are uh, two, Two extremes, uh, two extreme answers on this question. So the first one is discretionary access control, which means that the user is, uh, so, so the owner of an object will set the privileges for other subjects. And uh, that makes sense if it's the owner that owns the data that uh, it can set who, who else is uh, allowed to access it. So for instance, if Alice creates a file F, then she can set that Bob can read from F, but he cannot write to F. And so this is the classical setting. Uh, so this is the origin of discretionary access control. It comes from, from the file systems in, in computers. Now, in, in modern times, most people have their own computers and that computer only has one user on it, so it doesn't make that much difference uh, setting the permissions. Uh, so most users probably don't uh, see this. 
but uh, it exists and it's still used because uh, some files are uh, like system files are protected from from the user as well uh, so you, you are more likely to see this in in for instance social networks where you uh, share a photo and then you can decide who to share it with so that's discretionary access control the other end of the spectrum is mandatory access control and here the policy is enforced by the system so uh, the the system makes sure that the policy is followed and there is nothing the user can do about it so for instance uh, the classical example you know, of mandatory access control is for military information systems so general alice here, here has uh, access to files f0 to fn so all of these files and then she writes the file f which is a new file and now the system will enforce that only those who have access to f0 to fn can access f so major bob down here he has only access to f f1 uh, to fn so he's uh, missing uh, uh, sorry fn minus one so he's missing fn and he's missing uh, f0 so he is denied access uh, now the rationale for for this type of system is that since alice has access to f0 to fn here that means that f is basically a function of f0 to fn and this means that there might be some trace of uh, fn and f0 in F and Bob is not allowed to access uh, those two files which means that uh, there is a risk that some information about these two are leaked through F so then Bob should not be allowed to access F either so uh, we will finish this session with an exercise so I want you to think a bit about uh, what kind of uh, access control model do you prefer for a social network? You want a discretionary or mandatory? And think about what would these models look like in that setting? And probably you would like to have uh, uh, some sort of combination of the two. And what would it look like? Think about that. And uh, that's everything for this time. Thanks a lot.